Hello, I am Amandine Pra, and I teach audio production here at the University of Lethbridge. I started my professional life as a music producer and as an audio engineer. And within the past four years, I drastically reduced my studio activities because I cannot swallow the gender discrimination issues that I have to face in the studio anymore. Now, I am dedicating the energy that I used to put in studio production into research and education partnerships that aim to enhance equity in music production. I will introduce this talk about gendered experiences of microaggression and discrimination in the recording studio, which is based on an international survey that was funded by the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada to be carried out in partnership with the Audio Engineering Society. Then, my colleague Dr. Afina Ilafros from the Sociology Department will present our methods. Grace Brooks, PhD candidate at McGill, audio engineer and noise artist based in Montreal, will walk through, through the statistical results of the survey. And Monica Loquet, who studies sociology here at the UFL, will highlight the qualitative analysis of the stories and comments that the survey respondents shared with us. Before I move on, I must warn you that we will be discussing experiences of harassment, assault, sexual violence, and other traumatic incidents during this presentation. Let's first look at the gender demographics of audio engineering. The Women's Audio Mission and an AS paper from 2016 agree that only 5% of audio engineers and music producers are women and gender non-conforming people. This percentage is extremely low, even for a male-dominated field. For instance, 16% of the people serving in the US Army and in the Canadian Forces are women. Also, according to the National Association of Women in Construction, women make up 9% of the US construction workforce. I chose the Army and construction as two examples of fields that are commonly seen as masculine and not so attractive for women because of the needs to deal with danger, to be physical, working far from home, sometimes for several months. Nevertheless, these two fields count way more women than audio engineering. An Annenberg study looked at the credits of the 600 pop songs that made it to the Billboard end of the year charts between 2012 and 2017. And we can observe that only 2% of the credited producers were women. In total, there were 651 people credited as producers on these 600 songs, and only two were women from the underrepresented racial or ethnic groups. This study also reminds us that no woman has ever won the Grammy for Best Producer in the non-classical category. It should be noted, however, that the Billboard and the Recording Academy are Western-centric institutions that are strongly influenced by the four major labels whose headquarters are located in the USA and in the UK, and therefore they do not accurately represent the global music industry. This gender paradigm is reflected in the audio industry at large. According to a study by Kat Young and their collaborators from the Department of Electronic Engineering at York University in the UK, women represented less than 2% of the presenters of invited papers at AES conventions between 2012 and 2019. Nevertheless, women in audio are not giving up. Within the past year, several books written by women producers and engineers came out. Leslie Gaston Bird, who founded the AES DIY Committee, did justice to the important discoveries made by women who shaped the history of audio since the 1830s, but who were forgotten and whose contributions were most often attributed to men. Dr. Samantha Bennett offered us a critical history of recording methods in which she maps recorded statutes and underlines a tendency for audio mania in our field. Renowned producer Sylvia Massey, who has had a huge presence on social media for many years, has just released a creative book on her unconventional music recording techniques. Finally, Dr. Paula Wolf advises women to maintain control of their sound in their home studio, at least until they gather enough self-confidence to face the patriarchal culture of the commercial recording studio. To better understand how the social culture of the commercial recording studio as a workplace led to such harsh gender demographics. Our goal is to answer the following research questions. 
What are music producers, audio engineers, and studio assistants' experiences of social discrimination and microaggression in the commercial recording studio? And how can these experiences be understood in broader context? How do gender, sexual orientation, race and ethnicity, level of ability, and age impact these experiences of social discrimination and microaggression? And to what extent do women experiences of microaggressions in the commercial recording studio compare with women's experiences of microaggressions in STEM field? I will now let Dr. Afena Ilafros explain to you our academic approach for this survey. My name is Dr. Athena Alafros, and I'm a qualitative cultural sociologist who studies social inequality. Intersectionality emerged from the work of activists, Black feminists, critical race scholars, and sociologists such as Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw, Dr. Patricia Hill Collins, and Dr. Leslie McCall. Although the term was coined by Crenshaw, the idea of intersectionality was already present in the works of queer Black feminists and activists, such as the Combahee River Collective, Audre Lorde, and Bell Hooks, among many others. Intersectionality is a theoretical approach, methodological orientation, and praxis. As Collins reminds us, it is a broad-based, collaborative, and heterogeneous intellectual and political project. In a recent Time Magazine interview, Crenshaw defines it as, quote, it's basically a lens, a prism for seeing the way in which various forms of inequality often operate together and exacerbate each other, end quote. Our project examines the experiences of microaggressions and discrimination in the recording studio through an intersectional lens. We wanted to document if and how microaggressions impact some groups more than others in the field. So what are microaggressions? The term was originally coined by Dr. Chester Middlebrook Pierce to describe brief indignities that convey hostility toward a racialized group. Although Dr. Pierce used the term micro, this does not mean he saw these experiences as insignificant. He used this term micro to highlight how microaggressions are an everyday occurrence rather than a trivial one. As you will see from our respondents' stories, microaggressions are often indicative of macro hostilities. A key scholar in the field of microaggressions is Dr. Daryl Wing Sue. Sue and his colleagues define microaggressions as, quote, everyday verbal, nonverbal, and environmental slights, snubs, or insults, whether intentional or unintentional, that communicate hostile, derogatory, or negative messages to target persons based solely upon their marginalized group membership, end quote. In addition to race-based microaggressions, scholars now examine gender, class, ability, sexuality, and other types of microaggressions and the intersections between them. In their work, Dr. Sue and colleagues have identified three kinds of microaggressions. Microassaults are blatant verbal, nonverbal, or environmental attacks intended to convey discriminatory and biased sentiments. For example, Women are too emotional and irrational to be good audio engineers. Micro insults are unintentional behaviors or verbal comments that convey rudeness, insensitivity, or demean a person's racial heritage, disability status, gender identity, sexual orientation identity, or other identity. For example, wow, you're a pretty good audio engineer for a woman. Micro invalidations are verbal comments or behaviors that exclude, negate, or dismiss the psychological thoughts, feelings, or experiential reality of the target group. For example, can you grab me a coffee, honey? I'm waiting for the audio engineer to arrive to start my session. Here are some of the harmful impacts of racial microaggressions highlighted by Dr. Sue and his colleagues. Although Sue and his colleagues focus on the harmful impacts of racial microaggressions here, we found similar discussions of harmful impacts from our respondents. So how do we measure microaggressions within an intersectional framework? Here we draw upon the work of Dr. Leslie McCall. Three tactics include, first, an anti-categorical approach. This offers a deconstruction of analytic categories. For example, critiquing social categories such as women to show how they are often framed in cisgender, middle-class, white, heterosexual, and able-bodied ways. Two, 
an intercategorical approach. This offers a strategic use of analytic categories to document relationships of inequality. For example, using social categories strategically in our survey. Three, an intracategorical approach. This offers a focus on particular social groups at neglected points of intersection. For example, focusing on women, trans, and non-binary folks who are marginalized in the audio engineering field. Our survey design highlights intercategorical complexity by strategically using analytic categories to document relationships of inequality in the studio. Our qualitative coding of the open-ended survey data uses an intercategorical approach by deductively coding open-ended survey responses into three kinds of microaggressions to examine which groups of studio professionals are most likely to experience them, and an intra-categorical approach by inductively coding our data and focusing on gender as our primary analytic lens to capture the range of experiences of our respondents. In today's talk, we are focusing primarily on our survey analysis and the findings from our deductive coding. Let's now turn to the survey instrument. Our survey was available in 19 languages. It had a demographic portion with 17 closed-ended and 10 open-ended questions on topics listed here. It also had a microaggressions portion with 53 closed-ended questions using a five-point Likert scale from strongly disagree to strongly agree. Our instrument was adapted from Dr. Yang Yang and Dr. Doris Wright Carroll's STEM study that drew upon both Dr. Gianni A. Lewis and Dr. Helen A. Neville's survey instrument, C factors A, B, and C listed below, and Dr. Kevin L. Nadal's survey instrument. C.4 on workplace and school microaggressions. Below are some examples of microaggression statements from our survey. How did we recruit people? First, you had to answer yes to the following question. In the last 10 years, have you worked as a music producer and or audio engineer and or studio assistant for other people's music in the recording studio? To recruit, we used personal contacts in the field to conduct a pretest with just over 100 people. We actively recruited respondents at the Audio Engineering Society Convention in New York in October 2019. Grace Brooks recruited respondents through a European tour of audio institutions. The survey was posted on the AES website for AES members. We sent emails to all AES sections. And we also recruited from women audio organizations and groups, as well as social media platforms such as LinkedIn and Twitter. Let's now turn to our respondent demographics. Here is a map showing the concentration of survey responses by country of residence. We had the highest number of responses from engineers based in the United States, followed by Canada, Germany, and France in the next category. In the third category, we have the United Kingdom and Argentina. The rest had less than 10 respondents. Here are the demographic variables. Drawing upon the work of Dr. Kathy Charmaz, we adopted a grounded approach to code respondent self-definitions into appropriate strategic categories. Where possible, we allowed respondents to self-identify, and we then inductively coded responses into categories for the purposes of statistical analysis. For our qualitative analyses, we are drawing upon respondents' own self-definitions. Gender was determined using sex assigned at birth and current gender identity. Respondents could choose from predetermined options or self-defined. For the statistical portion, we used three categories, trans non-binary, cisgender woman, and cisgender man. Sexual orientation was an open-ended question. For the statistical portion, we manually coded all responses into heterosexual and non-heterosexual. For race and ethnicity, we asked participants to self-describe their race and or ethnicity and whether they were a racial minority in their workplace. For the statistical portion, responses were coded, no, I am not a racial or ethnic minority in the workplace. Yes, I am a non-white uh, racial or ethnic minority. 
And yes, I am a white person in a predominantly non-white workplace. For disability status, we ask participants whether they identify as someone with disabilities and to further self-identify if they selected yes to the previous question. For the statistical portion, responses were coded into three categories. No disability, yes, invisible disability, and yes, visible disability. Migration status was coded as no if a respondent's country of residence was the same as their country of origin, and yes if they differed. Age and years on the job was calculated by subtracting year of birth and the year they started working in the studio, counted back from 2020. We received the responses of 387 producers, audio engineers, and studio assistants who had worked on other people's music production in the last 10 years. In this table, you can see the gender breakdown of the respondents and the level of income of their countries of residence based on the World Bank GNI classification. You can also see how many are living in a different country than the one they are from, how many identify as a non-white racial or ethnic minority in the workplace, how many identify as non-heterosexual, and how many reported having disabilities. Finally, we are using both quantitative statistics and qualitative analysis or grounded theory in order to best capture the complexities of an intersectional approach. Mixed methods are well suited for capturing the big picture of structural inequality within audio engineering or the macro level and individual experiences and stories of microaggressions or the micro level. Hello everybody, I'm Grace Brooks and I'm going to run you through the statistical results from our recent microaggression study. The first stage in understanding the data we collected with this survey instrument was to run descriptive statistics. This allowed us to place our quantitative findings in context and understand the areas of focus and limitations of the data set. Following this, we ran a series of statistical tests in order to provide bare bones answers to our research questions. In order to provide a quantitative answer to the research question one, what are music producers, audio engineers, and studio assistants' experiences of social discrimination and microaggression in the commercial recording studio, we ran one-way Kruskal-Wallace tests along with Dunn's multiple comparison tests and bootstrapped E-to-squared measures of effect size between the independent variables, so the demographic categories, and the responses to the microaggression survey, as well as several other dependent variables, including daily rate and how often the participants reported being properly credited. In order to address research question two, how did gender, sexual orientation, race and ethnicity, level of ability and age impact these experiences of social discrimination and microaggressions, we ran two-way ANOVAs for paired categorical factors. So for example, the intersectional influence of gender and sexual orientation upon experiences of microaggressions in the recording studio. In this figure, we see the central results from these statistical tests. Colored entries indicate statistically significant relationships, with square color indicating effect size, yellow for small, orange for medium, and red for large. On the x-axis, we have demographic category, so gender, sexual orientation, race, ethnicity, disability, migration, GNI of country of residence, and age. And on the y-axis, we have daily rate, so on average how much money participants made in a day from audio engineering, how often the participants reported being properly credited for their work, and aggregate microaggression scores for the different types of microaggressions we studied. Of the demographic categories considered in this analysis, we found that gender was by far the strongest predictor of experiences of discrimination and microaggressions in the recording studio. Gender had either large or medium effects sizes upon aggregate scores for all of the microaggression factors, except for racial workplace microaggressions. Four microaggressions factors had large effect sizes for gender, which are in red here. Assumptions of beauty and sexual object objectification, silencing and marginalization, stereotyping, and gender-linked workplace microaggressions. Our findings indicate that gender plays both a highly statistically significant role in determining the microaggressions and discrimination experienced by studio engineers, and is, of the major demographic categories we considered within this study, the primary determining factor of these experiences in the studio. We can unpack these results a little bit in order to understand how these effect sizes look in terms of the responses to the individual microaggressions questions. Each of these questions was of the form, in the studio in the last 10 years, I have experienced X microaggression, and the responses were on a five-point Likert scale from strongly disagree to strongly agree. 
This figure shows the mean responses to each individual microaggression question, aggregated by the gender of participant. Blue is cisgender men, red is cisgender women, and black is transgender and non-binary people. The colors at the bottom correspond to the effect sizes of gender upon that microaggressions block. I'll run through a couple of interesting things that I think are worth noting. First of all, we can see that overall the answers of women and transgender and non-binary people skew strongly towards strongly agree and tend to be significantly different from those of cisgender men, whereas those of cisgender men tend to skew towards strongly disagree or at most hover around neither disagree nor agree, which is the yellow line I've drawn in the middle here. The responses of cisgender women and transgender and non-binary people were overall largely similar, but on some particular types of microaggressions, either one or the other group reported experiencing those microaggressions more often. For example, cisgender women reported experiencing more gender-linked workplace microaggressions than did transgender and non-binary people, whereas trans and non-binary people reported experiencing more sexual orientation-linked workplace microaggressions. Following gender, the next most important demographic category influencing experiences of microaggressions and discrimination was age. It's interesting to note that men reported experiencing more silencing and marginalization and age-linked microaggressions than other kinds of microaggression, although they still experience fewer of these kinds of microaggressions than did women. This reflects the patriarchal structure of the studio that requires young professionals to develop a thick skin and to embrace the rules and conventions of the workplace in order to pursue a career in that field. Younger participants not only experienced increased incidences of sexual objectification, silencing and marginalization, gender, age-linked and disability workplace microaggressions, but we also found that both gender and age had a significant medium-sized effect on how much money participants made working in audio. On this plot, on the x-axis, we have the number of years that the participant had been working in the studio. On the y-axis, we have their daily rate in US dollars. We can see that the majority of participants make under 100 US dollars a day for their work in audio engineering. Cisgender men, making over 50% of their income from audio, made an average of 74 US dollars a day, whereas trans and non-binary people made an average of 56 US dollars a day. And finally, cisgender women, making over half their income from audio, made an average of only 51 US dollars a day. This daily rate increased with age at a rate of 3.74 US dollars a day. This significant gender discrepancy in how much participants in this study were paid for their work is also accompanied by significant differences in which tasks participants take on in a studio context. Cisgender women were 25% more likely to report assisting than were cisgender men. However, when we included only participants under the age of 30 in the analysis, we found this result not to be significant, indicating that the finding is mainly due to the small number of older women who participate in the survey. However, cisgender men were 21% more likely to answer mastering than were cisgender women, independent of age. It's worth noting that mastering is generally considered a relatively more lucrative role for an audio engineer than, say, assisting or mixing. These findings seem to point towards the reality of audio as an often underpaid and undervalued profession, an observation supported by the fact that many participants reported being improperly credited for the work that they do. Gender, race, ethnicity, Disability, migration status, and age were all identified as statistically significant predictors of improper crediting, with gender having a large effect on how often the participant was properly credited and the rest of the demographic categories having small but significant effects. These pie charts show the demographic breakdown of the responses to the question, how often have you been properly credited on the album cover and or web pages for the tasks that you've accomplished, by gender. 13% of cisgender women reported almost never being properly credited for their work, and 16% reported being almost always properly credited for their work, in comparison to the 6% of cisgender men who reported almost never being properly credited, and 33% who reported almost always being properly credited. Even for the demographic categories with a small effect size on proper crediting, this result is dramatic. For example, 30% of participants who were non-white racial minorities in their place of work reported almost never, and 16% reported almost always, being properly credited, compared to 6% and 31% of participants who were not racial minorities in their workplace. Returning to the other demographic categories we considered in this study, sexual orientation was associated with medium-sized effects on both gender workplace microaggressions and sexual orientation microaggressions, as well as small effects on sexual objectification, silencing and marginalization, and age-linked workplace microaggressions. Race and ethnicity was, as we have just seen, significantly associated with being improperly credited, as well as silencing and marginalization, gender, and racial workplace microaggressions. 
Having migrated was associated with differences in crediting, as well as with cultural workplace microaggressions. The gross national income of the country that the participant lives in was additionally associated with stereotyping, cultural, and workplace racial microaggressions. Finally, having a disability was significantly associated with experiencing a host of different kinds of microaggressions, from being improperly credited to sexual objectification, silencing and marginalization, and stereotyping microaggressions, as well as workplace microaggressions associated with gender, sexual orientation, culture, and race. Having a disability also had a medium-sized effect on the likelihood of experiencing disability-linked workplace microaggressions. So, to move on to research question three, is the situation in audio engineering actually that unusual for a technical field? Specifically, how do the experiences of women in audio engineering compare to those of women working in other STEM fields? We compared our findings with those reported by Yang and Carol in their 2019 study of the experiences of cisgender women working in STEM academia, and found that cisgender women working in the studio reported experiencing much more microaggressions and discrimination than did cisgender women working in STEM academia. Specifically, 24%, 33%, and 33% more cisgender women working in the studio responded with an average of neither disagree nor agree or over for microaggressions factors, sexual objectification, silence and marginalization, and workplace gender microaggressions. Additionally, 9%, 17%, 11%, and 14% more of the cisgender women we surveyed had experienced one or more microaggressions from these factors at some time. So our study shows that from a purely numeric perspective, audio engineering is indeed an exceptional technical field in terms of the amount of discrimination experienced by women working within it. Hi, I'm Monica, and I'm going to be discussing our qualitative results, specifically looking at microaggressions and respondent demographics. Since our focus is on gender, I want to start by showing a breakdown of microaggressions experienced by gender. This slide shows the number of cases that had a microaggression coded to them. So in the upper right hand corner, we can see that we had in total 150 respondents. This is significantly smaller than our 387 number discussed in the statistical results as only 150 people completed the written portion of the survey. Our bottom row shows the number of unique cases where the column on the far right hand side shows the gross number of cases coded, meaning that some individuals had more than one type of microaggression coded to them. As a whole, 68% of our respondents reported experiencing some form of a microaggression. Now it's worth noting that 60% of our respondents are cisgender men, which is important to keep in mind because while the number of microaggressions they've experienced looks similar to the number of microaggressions experienced by women, men also have nearly double the number of respondents. Now what's interesting is that nearly every female respondent has experienced some form of a microaggression, while just over half of our male respondents said they did. However, I also want to point out something about the two female respondents who did not report any experiences of microaggressions. I actually went and tracked down what they had to say about this in the survey. So this respondent had actually done an entire dissertation on the level of inequality present in the industry. She wrote this as a response to one of our questions and chose not to answer any of the others, meaning that she was not coded as having experienced microaggressions. Although it would appear that she is aware of these incidents occurring, having done a research project on the topic. Our second respondent who was not coded as having experienced microaggressions responded to only one question, and this is what they said. This respondent has obviously faced a lot of trauma in their work and has chosen not to bring it up in this survey. So knowing what these two women have said, I do feel comfortable in acknowledging that every woman who has answered this survey has experienced some form of a microaggression in the workplace. Now I want to illustrate a different perspective on the results of microaggressions by gender identity. This image showcases the number of references coded, not the amount of cases coded. So this means that in our pool of 150 respondents, we recorded 257 instances of microaggressions. 
What is really illustrative about these results is that women experienced the majority of these microaggressions, making up 61% of the total instances recorded. Now, I'm going to be focusing on frequencies rather than individual cases, as they do highlight a number of interesting findings in the data. First, I'm going to read some examples of microaggressions using quotes from our survey respondents. First off, though, I would like to start by showing this quote from a respondent to show how we approached our coding process. This is an example of a response that contains multiple instances of microaggressions and was thus broken up into separate codes. In the bottom right hand corner, we are describing demographic characteristics of the respondent as they were submitted by them and not how they were coded by us. So the yellow highlight has been coded as a micro assault as it involves threats and a conscious and deliberate attempt to harm the respondent. Whereas the green highlight, we coded this as a micro invalidation as our respondents feelings and experiential reality were invalidated by this artist's behavior. So we followed this process for all of the survey responses, and I do hope that this gives a bit of insight into how we coded our qualitative data. So for an example of a micro assault, we have here, quote, I had an artist in the studio with me who made a comment about what color he thought my genitals were to a visiting colleague. Our next example, when helping to track and produce three different artists that are white, I was told I was, quote, too pushy and militant. However, the other producer who had the same style of direction was called assertive, and they appreciated his directness. So for an example of a micro insult, we have here, quote, I had a very well-respected male musician tell me your work is getting better, as if I were terrible before. I've also literally been told verbatim, you're good for a girl musician. And our second example of a micro insult. Over time, I have learned that the quote, reliable and capable audio engineer is someone who is white, heteronormative, and cis male. Anyone who looks different is seen as an outsider. Being Asian is not necessarily seen as negative by the artist or other audio engineers, but neither is it included in the definition. Therefore, I never feel accepted in the community and I'm rarely offered opportunities. I feel there is no way to progress in my career. So our next examples are micro invalidations. No change other than I've had to be much more loud about how I know what I am doing. It's made me fearful of asking for help. It is as if women are supposed to know everything or nothing and asking for help means we're idiots. But men can sit around a pedal for hours and question each other without being rude. And lastly, I have been very obviously passed over at AES. I was walking with my male partner at the AES exhibition floor, looking at microphones. I was at the booth first and was talking to the representative who didn't have much to say to me. As soon as my partner came, the representative talked over me to get to him. Literally, I was between them and he talked over my head. So that's it for our examples. Now we're going to look at the intersections of microaggressions with gender. And again, we're going to be focusing on intracategorical complexity, which means focusing on particular social groups at neglected points of intersection. Cisgender men are displayed at the top here with the number of each microaggression coded as well. The sub rows detail their racial identity separated into three categories not a minority in their workplace, but of varying racial ethnicities, a minority in their workplace and non-white, and a minority in their workplace and white. Cisgender women are far and away experiencing more microaggressions here than anyone else. For cisgender women who are not a minority in their workplace, there is an average of three microaggressions recorded per respondent. But for non-white cisgender women who are a minority at their workplace, they are experiencing an average of 4.6 microaggressions per respondent, highlighting the notion that racial identity may play a role in the frequency of microaggressions experienced by women who are a minority in the audio engineering field. 
And when it comes to sexual orientation, our results for cisgender women illuminate a number of interesting findings, which is why I'll be highlighting them here over cisgender men and trans and non-binary folks. So this heat map shows that an average of six microaggressions were experienced by pansexual and polyamorous women, an average of five for women with multiple sexual orientations, and about three each for bisexual and asexual women, with an average of under three for heterosexual women. So who is responsible for committing microaggressive behavior? From this, we can see that the vast majority of microaggressions come from studio professionals, such as colleagues, supervisors, and studio owners. So what's next? We're moving into the inductive coding phase, which involves us taking a second look at our data to find the nuanced themes that may have been overlooked during the microaggressions coding. We are using a grounded theory approach from Kathy Sharmaz, meaning that our work is grounded in the data. We are not applying certain lenses, rather we're using the data to inform our conclusions. One of the things that we have noticed is that many respondents wrote about how they have adapted to microaggressive behavior, which includes things like dressing more conservatively, wearing less makeup, wearing a wedding ring, modulating their tone of voice, and selectively working with people they trust and are familiar with. So I'd like to end with this quote, because I believe it really shows how women are treated in this industry and how their avenues for change are very narrow. Often, the only solution for a toxic workplace is to just leave it. The statistic and content analysis of the survey converge to show that gender is by far the most significant predictor of social discrimination in the recording studio. In addition to be less paid, improperly credited, sexually objectified and stereotyped, Non-male studio professionals are silenced and marginalized, and their expertise is constantly getting challenged, what Ebony Smith referred to as the burden of proof. Nevertheless, age, sexual orientation, race and ethnicity, disability, migrant status, and country of residence also have an impact. The biggest limitation of our survey is that we received responses from just over 8% of non-white participants who identified as a minority in their workplace. We also received a low number of responses from professionals who live in non-Western countries, and only 8% of the survey respondents reported having disabilities. Therefore, this research needs to be expanded to accurately document the culture of the commercial recording studio from a global perspective. The story of the cisgender West Indian black American woman who had to deal with a drunk musician throwing her blood in the studio is sticking with me. This story falls into the emotional displays that in most other work-based contexts or even social contexts would be considered inappropriate. In this view, Watson and Ward describe the intimacy of the recording studios as emotional spaces characterized by trust and tolerance. I would like to draw a parallel between the blood flowing up musician story and the types of stories that we keep hearing at AES events or reading in interviews about famous producers who succeeded in working with drunk or junky musicians and who implied that these extreme situations were worth it because they got such a good record out of them. What we rarely hear or read, however, is that the studio assistant had to clean up the blood vomit and that the studio assistant was most likely not paid or paid under minimum wage, working 20 hours a day. And what we never hear or read is that if the assistant or the engineer was a woman, she was most likely sexually assaulted by the drunk or junkie musicians, and that if she complained to her team, she would be told that she was not made tough enough for the job. Regardless of our gender or other aspects of our social identity, we as music producers, audio engineers and studio assistants had to develop a thick skin to thrive in the studio. Most of us got treated abusively during our audio training and early years of career, and many of us still do not get properly paid or credited after more than 15 years on the job. The problem is that many studio professionals are proud of this situation and use it as a proof of their strong dedication for the profession without realizing that they also project demeaning experiences on young professionals, women, and representant of other minority social groups. 
In this view, I need to remind you that a large majority of the aggressions reported in the survey was committed by studio professionals. So this is a call for adult engineers and producers to engage in introspection and actions to stop the legacy of these practices, and instead to convey that our job is to catch vibes and to elicit emotions, for which maturity and awareness are way more useful than thick skins. I hope that this message will help us to stand up for our talent and for our skills to be more valued, paid and credited in the music industry. I would like to warmly thank all the people who helped with this research. It's thanks to the funding that we got from SHERC, to the survey respondents, to all the people who volunteered and who helped us organize this talk, that we were able to present the findings of the survey today. Our team is working on publishing two peer-reviewed articles on the survey outcomes. Also, on Wednesday, October the 28th, Grace Brooks and I are co-chairing a panel at the AES convention titled Unlocking the Control Room, Equity Achievements in Audio Engineering. Now, I would like to launch the Q&A with three topics. First, solutions to reduce the gender imbalance in the studio and at school so that this type of facilities can benefit the most motivated young people and not just the most privileged people. Second, solutions to improve the work conditions and acknowledgement of studio professionals. And third, solutions to prevent discrimination in the commercial recording studio and any informal industry. Thank you. <laughs>